Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's graph reading group. With Maxim, who is presenting his paper on the recoverability of graph representations. And if you want to join a future reading group session to yourself, find the information in the description. Uh, yeah. So I'm uh, Maxim Fishman, uh, working, uh, doing my master at Technion, uh, advised by Chaim, Dr. Chaim Baskin, Dr. Ron Banner, and uh, Professor Avi Mendelssohn. I'm going to uh, talk today about the notion of recoverability and the connection, uh, its connection is to the information aggregation in graph neural networks. Uh, this work was uh, done in collaboration with uh, Almog David and uh, Evgeny Zhutonovsky. <clears throat> so uh, the agenda is going to be as follows. So we will, uh, I will start from some motivational example where I will um, raise a couple of interesting questions and uh, then uh, uh, drive the notion of uh, recoverability and use it in the collection of experiments that I will discuss. And uh, during this uh, experiments, we will show, uh, we will see the connection between uh, recoverability loss and mutual information. Also, during this uh, talk, I will uh, use uh, tools from the measure theory. So I will uh, touch a little bit the basics of uh, measure theory as well. So uh, let's start from the motivational example. Uh, in this talk, I focus uh, mainly on uh, node property prediction tasks where we uh, have as input uh, a graph uh, where each node then do it with uh, its uh, uh, features and uh, also it has uh, some uh, uh, some value some class or value property that we should predict okay so here the collection of uh, uh, this collection of faces is actually not features and the collection of y's is uh, is uh, the target that we would like to predict uh, before we even consider the connections between uh, nodes we can uh, take all this uh, task by uh, treating those two sets as being sampled from two random variables x and y and uh, try to find a map from random variable x to random variable y so we should impose some uh, restrictions on this map it should be at least uh, continuous uh, since we have a deal with the uh, differentiable algorithms. And uh, the problem is that uh, not always we have a continuous map from uh, random variable X to random variable Y, so that we have some best approximation that we can achieve. Uh, I denoted Y tilde, and it differs from Y by um, some additional node that we have uh, in N, okay? Additional, sorry, additional uh, noise that we have in, uh, in target. And uh, we, uh, we can uh, uh, look at this uh, noise as additional information that we have in, in uh, target, but we don't have enough information on features for being able to learn this, uh, this information. Uh, this is what we have uh, before we considering the connections between uh, nodes, but when uh, uh, we consider the connections, we can actually uh, apply some aggregation. So we can aggregate also information from neighborhood and uh, the proper aggregation may uh, reduce this amount of noise that we have in the output. Uh, and this, uh, uh, okay, so we have a lot, uh, many different ways to aggregate this information. The, each aggregation type can reduce differently this amount of noise and uh, this the reduction of amount of noise may indicate some the quality of this aggregation method for this specific uh, task, <clears throat> for this specific data set. So this uh, setting already raises uh, a couple of uh, interesting uh, questions. So the first one is related to aggregation method. Uh, we would like to find an aggregation method which reduces as much as it possible the, the the amount of noise in the output. Uh, and the second is uh, detecting, oh, okay. Second thing is related to the edges. So we there could be a subset of edges which uh, bring no useful information uh, with respect to this uh, target, with respect to this random variable. Uh, it means that if we um, 
drop this subset of edges, we basically do not uh, change this amount of noise. So uh, detecting su such subset of edges is very important since uh, it's very important for, for instance, for the large scale graphs training and inference where we would like to uh, specify the graph uh, before training or, or during the training to increase to the increase the speed of the inference. Uh, so uh, here specifically, I define it only the random variable X, which uh, indicates the node features. I didn't uh, define yet the random variable, which indicates the neighborhood. So this is what I would like to do in the next slide. Uh, the one of the ways of aggregation of information is the aggregation of information from the direct neighbors. Uh, each for each node, we aggregate the information from direct neighbors, and if you uh, each layer aggregates information from direct neighbors, and if you would like to aggregate information from uh, distant nodes, we should stack these layers in, in the sequence. Uh, so, if we are focusing on a single layer, uh, spe specifically here, it's an instance of the at the beginning, but we can uh, consider the same, do the same analysis for. Uh, for uh, intermediate layer. So uh, for a single layer, it uh, each time receives the node features and uh, the collection of its direct neighbors and uh, does something with that and uh, produces the node embedding. Uh, so I uh, so we define two random variables six and h, uh, the pretty straightforward from the to just uh, the the node features and the node banks are outcomes of these random variables. And uh, a, a new random variable that uh, I defined that indicates the neighborhood is the random variable uh, Z. And uh, to understand its uh, meaning, it's uh, conv uh, convenient to look at it uh, through the following uh, stochastic process. You just uh, take the graph and they uniformly sample some node from the graph, and then you uniformly sample some uh, uh, neighboring node of previously sampled node. And the features of this node is going to be the outcome of this random variable Z. Uh, it's actually here is a definition. So when you take the Z, the Z and condition can on X equal to the XI, it's just the uh, uniform uh, uh, some value from a uniformly sampled some value of the ne direct neighbors. Uh, so this way we basically encode the uh, graph structure uh, structure into the random variable. Uh, here is the simple example which uh, actually uh, shows that that we have this uh, graph structure encoded in it. Uh, any questions or everything is clear till now? Okay. So um, okay. So. Let us continue to the uh, uh, to the previous example. So now we are uh, equipped with two random variables x and uh, z, and what we can do is uh, basically um, apply some continuous map from x and z to to h. Okay, so it, it produces the new random variable h. So this any continuous map is actually some aggregation method since we aggregate information from Z. And uh, then after this uh, aggregation, it's a single layer, but we can do the same thing for, uh, for, for each layer, okay? So uh, after this aggregation, we can use this H uh, for, uh, for learning Y from it, okay? So uh, uh, what, uh, okay, so when, when, okay, so when we, uh, uh, do, so, so we can actually uh, look at it in the following way. So, suppose given us, uh, we are given two two functions, two continuous maps, uh, g one and g two, such that they give you the best approximation of y, uh, one uh, from x, another one from h, and uh, I define here two uh, random variables which indicate the noise, and we see that the amount of noise of n two after the aggregation of information is less than. Uh, the amount of noise that we have before the aggregation, which means that we actually aggregated the useful information from Z uh, for uh, being able to learn better approximation of Y. <clears throat> What's the problem with that? Uh, actually, it will be nice to uh, check the amount of noise, but the problem is that we need to uh, know this uh, function uh, G uh, for uh, for estimation for estimating this uh, amount of noise, <clears throat> uh, so I would like to find some way to estimate this amount of noise even before 
uh, uh, finding this G1, G2 to be more convenient for me to, to check different uh, possible uh, aggregation methods. Uh, okay, when we are uh, uh, talking about the uh, self-supervised setting, in self-supervised setting, we don't have Y anymore. We would like to uh, uh, find some aggregation uh, a node embedding, which uh, is uh, good uh, in such a way that in, after that in downstream task, uh, we will be able to learn why uh, from it. Uh, so uh, the best thing that we can do is basically aggregate as much information as it possible from X and Z. And suppose that we uh, have a continuous map from H to X and to Z. Uh, it means that uh, we have all information about X and Z in H, okay? And, uh, and uh, we would like to know if there exists such continuous map. And if it does not exist, then I would like to know how far we are from the stage uh, that it exists, okay? And if I uh, suppose that I have such a measurement, uh, which is differentiable, then I can use it in unsupervised setting to minimize it and, uh, and uh, aggregate as much from X and Z in uh, node embedding. Uh, okay. So, uh, I, I, okay, so for uh, finding this uh, map, I, uh, I uh, turn it into the, into the measure theory, okay. Uh, to the Dubdinkin lemma. Uh, but Dubdinkin lemma, it involves uh, sigma algebra and measurable functions. So I need to do some uh, recap of these uh, things. I, I believe that uh, all of you actually uh, encountered it, it in some stage of your life, but I need to recap it. So, so basically, uh, yeah, what? Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, sigma algebra. So uh, sigma algebra can be interpreted as some information contained in the random variable, and uh, uh, it is defined in abstractly in the following way. So we have some abstract set of points uh, omega, and uh, A is a subset of uh, it's some collection of subsets which satisfies these uh, uh, things. Okay, these properties properties for being a sigma algebra. Uh, and uh, H sigma, algebra, uh, sigma algebras, they satisfy the following two properties. So the intersection of arbitrary collection of uh, sigma algebras is again, uh, the object that we obtain again satisfies this property. So it is again sigma algebra. This is a good property since uh, we can actually, uh, for any arbitrary collection of subset, we can find the smallest sigma algebra, which contains this uh, collection. Uh, such sigma algebra is called the generated sigma algebra from this collection. And uh, one example is the sigma algebra which is generated from the, from the topology on R and the power of N. Such sigma algebra is called the Borel sigma algebra. Uh, on other side, the union of two sigma algebras not necessarily satisfy these properties, uh, but we still can take uh, the small sigma algebra, algebra which contains this uh, union. Uh, Okay, so the second object is the uh, measurable functions. Measurable functions are those uh, functions which map from two, from one abstract set to another. Each set and do it with its own uh, sigma algebra. And uh, this function, are, in order to be measurable, it should uh, uh, preserve the structure of the sigma algebra. It should satisfy the following property. Uh, this is mathematically written and uh, it's like uh, the continuous map between two topological spaces there is some similarity between the two objects uh, uh, it, okay so uh, in the probability okay we, we we define the probability space which is a collection of three three objects where this omega is this one abstract uh, set of points and this uh, curly f is the sigma algebra p is the probability no, measure wait. yeah just to, to make Sure, maybe everyone's following a little bit. So we have these um, 
we have a set now we take uh, subsets of that set and these subsets are our sigma algebra and now these sigma algebras um, or the, this sigma algebra could be um, for example a unique smallest or the, the the smallest sigma algebra then it's called a Borel sigma algebra and for example we have the um, yeah the standards Borel sigma algebra on Rn that we work with often. And now you say a function is measurable if the, the pre-image is always a set of measurable, uh, is always inside of the sigma algebra, right? And right. now we get to a probability space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so the random variable x, uh, it's always some, okay, in order to be a random variable, it should uh, satisfy two properties. First one, it should be a map from omega to another object which has its own sigma algebra. Here specifically, R in the power of n has the Borel sigma algebra. And it should be measurable function. It should satisfy the following property. So I, I rewrote it here. And uh, this object uh, satisfies the properties of the sigma algebra. So it's sigma algebra in, in its own right. This uh, is uh, sigma x, I denote it. It's a sigma algebra generated from the random variable x. And it can be interpreted as uh, information contained in x. So uh, why? Uh, so this is uh, by virtue of the following uh, theorem, uh, lemma, the blinking lemma, which says that uh, given two random variables x and, in, and y, uh, we have two things uh, satisfied if and only if, okay? Uh, sigma algebra of y is a subset of sigma algebra of x if and only if there exists a measurable function uh, from x to y. Okay, this, from this uh, lemma, it, uh, it, uh, uh, we can understand that this is some sort of information, okay? As much as, as wider sigma algebra, so we have more information. Thus, we are able to learn from it uh, this random variable. Uh, uh, here are uh, several things, that, uh, several notes that I would like to, to say. The first one is that uh, here I say that this is a measurable function. The random variable is also a measurable function, but uh, measurable function is not a random variable in, in general. It's just uh, here specifically this function from R in the power of N uh, to some another R in, in the power of N, M, let's say. And uh, this uh, only some mathematical uh, tool for analysis. And uh, since this, map is from Borel sigma algebra to another Borel sigma algebra, uh, it include the collection of uh, all possible uh, measurable functions contains the collection of all continuous maps. And uh, thus, if this property is not satisfied, we don't have measurable function, thus we also don't have a continuous map. Can, can you explain your um, information, yeah, your information Term again, like your point two probability space. Why this thing is an information? Why sigma, sigma yes. x is from? Yeah. So uh, if uh, okay, so if you you have you have run the variable y, okay, and it has its own sigma algebra, and if this sigma algebra is a subset of this sigma algebra, then you have this map. So we can learn from x, y. Uh, you can interpret it as the amount of information. Okay, good. Because we also have in the chat, is the information in, in, in sense of Shannon's theory? So is this somehow related to uh, Shannon information? It's a, it's a, it's related to the mutual formation. I will uh, I will uh, yes. then uh, emphasize it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm talking about the sigma algebra specifically for uh, uh, 
uh, explaining further this connection since he, it's uh, rather uh, easier to explain it uh, in terms of sigma algebras than just in words. <laughs> I mean, uh, you'll have a um, you'll have a whole section on that, right? Relating the yeah, yeah, things. yeah. I will help. Okay, so uh, from okay, uh, so uh, uh, from the other side, uh, okay. If if this is satisfied, it it means that we have a measurable function, but uh, it not not necessarily we have a continuous map, but. Uh, but uh, in majority cases, uh, we can approximate uh, measurable functions by the uh, continuous uh, functions. Okay, uh, any questions regarding this? Additional questions? No additional ones on my side. No. Okay, so... Uh, Okay, going back to our uh, to, uh, to our example, uh, uh, we can consider a set of situations, set of possible situations. The first one is uh, that the sigma algebra of y is a subset of sigma algebra of x. Uh, this sigma algebra of x is always a subset of this thing since uh, this is the small sigma algebra which contains this union. And if this thing is this inclusion is satisfied, then it means that uh, we actually don't need the information in, in, in Z. We can drop away this, uh, this nodes, uh, this uh, edges, right? uh, and uh, apply MLP and uh, learn why. Uh, if, this, if we don't have such situation, we have instead of the, the following one, sigma algebra of is a subset of sigma H. Uh, again, this inclusion all, always satisfies since we have a continuous map here. Uh, this inclusion says that we actually we have a perfect embedding since we embedded exactly the information that we need for uh, for learning why. Uh, and uh, the problem is that in general case we don't have this uh, thing also satisfied. Uh, but somehow uh, when we after the aggregation. Uh, we have we uh, are able to learn uh, y better than before the aggregation in specific data sets. So we collected the collection of. Uh, I will show that further. <clears throat> so for uh, understanding why we have such a case, we uh, relax. We did a relaxation of uh, this condition, and uh, the relaxation of this condition is a recoverability. Uh, so. Uh, the okay, so I, I'm going to define now the recoverability. So we have two random variables, x and y, and uh, I define the collection cx, uh, which is the collection of all random variables which are fully recoverable from x. And uh, what does mean fully recoverable? Which means that sigma algebra of z is a subset of sigma algebra of x. It means that each z can be learned from x. And uh, all of these random variables are uh, live in the same space as y. So we can actually compute the distance from this set to y. So the distance is uh, the recoverability loss. Uh, when this distance is equal to zero, it means that uh, y is, uh, uh, is an element in this set, C cx. And thus, we have uh, this inclusion. So we can uh, learn y from, from x. Uh, and uh, we have an ability to estimate this uh, this uh, object uh, from uh, from a collection of samples. So it's the front of variables. We have a, a n collection a n pairs of samples x and y, and uh, we can estimate this recoverability loss. The proof is given uh, uh, in the paper. So the we should do the following. We, we first compute uh, the this matrix. We are using the universal kernel, and after that, uh, uh, compute the orthogonal projection to the image of K, and uh, use this orthogonal projection here. We put it here. We, as a result, we uh, we obtain the estimation of the recoverability loss. Okay. <clears throat> 
So the first, uh, so currently I'm going to uh, talk about the different experiments that we did. So the first uh, couple of experiments is uh, are synthetic and they are uh, testing the recoverability loss. And after that, we are uh, we will cover the experiments on the on the graph neural networks. So this uh, first synthetic experiment it. Uh, it shows uh, emphasis how the recoverability loss uh, works actually. So we have here uh, <clears throat> x, which is a normal uh, distributed random variable, and uh, two uh, additional random variables z and w. Where in z we uh, we have the full information about x, and in w we don't have it since we lost the sign. Uh, so we cannot recover from fully from uh, from wx uh, but we can recover fully from zx and this is what we actually uh, see here ah, and and in addition we can recover z and w from x since we have the continuous maps explicit continuous maps this is what uh, we see here uh, the, those are theoretical results and those are the estimated results. So uh, regarding the theoretical results, I, I should emphasize here that uh, when you take P equal to two, uh, then this uh, collection is a uh, Hilbert uh, subspace and uh, the minimizer of uh, this distance is the orthogonal projection to this Hilbert subspace and it's equal to the conditional expectation of Y given X. And thus we know how to compute it theoretically. <clears throat> uh, second, the synthetic uh, test was uh, done on uh, uh, two independent uh, least sampled uh, 100 dimensional uh, random vectors. Uh, and the y is computed in the following way where the alpha is some parameter. And we see that uh, there is some correlation between uh, theoretical and estimate results. <clears throat> so, the so next exper uh, experiment is uh, okay. So we uh, did the following: we we took five different data sets and applied it on uh, uh, on the node features the following simple aggregation method. And this aggregation method, we uh, drop it uh, all uh, learnable parameters. It's very simple. We applied it on the node features uh, three times. Uh, it's like a three consecutive layers. And uh, then compute the recoverability loss of uh, y given x and of y given h. Uh, so this is what we received. So here are five different data sets and the uh, recoverability loss estimated of y given uh, x. Uh, those are uh, numbers that we achieved. We receive it. And uh, the recoverability loss of y given h, we uh, have uh, a drop, OK, lower numbers. And uh, so it's smaller, which means that uh, actually we aggregated the information from the neighboring nodes, OK, for this. It's a property of this data set. So we, uh, if we apply uh, this uh, very simple aggregation method, we already may uh, achieve better uh, accuracy. Uh, for GBM products, we see very uh, huge drop. So we actually can use it that without learnable parameters and increases pretty pretty high, highly the accuracy. Uh, for Flickr, for instance, we don't see a drop. So it means that this aggregation method is not good for it. <clears throat> And this experiment is very interesting since it emphasizes that uh, the necessity of uh, the graph neural networks actually in this specific data sets. Any questions? Well, the necessity of graph neural networks in these specific data sets with respect to um, looking at the information from neighbors, right? But if you just have um, if you have the information uh, as well, but not in a graph neural network message passing type of way, then yeah, this is not what we're saying that um, we do not need, right? Uh, 
Garcia, what, what I mean? Uh, here specifically, we aggregate information from their neighbors. So this is specific aggregation. And this is a special particular case of the, of the, of the message passing. Yeah, uh, but the comparison that we're making here, right, between, our, between your row uh, y of x and your um, mm -hmm. row y, yeah. y given h, right? Yeah, the, okay, maybe repeat what we have inside of the x and inside of the h. Inside of x, we have uh, only node features. Okay, X is uh, the random variable calling which and the node features are sampled. Okay, and yeah. uh, H is the random variable according which uh, this uh, vectors are sampled after the aggregation. Okay. So this would basically correspond to not having any, um, just processing your node features, right? The, the row Y of X our recoverability loss there. Here specifically, we don't have any information regarding the neighboring nodes. Yeah. And so, here we have. It, it yeah. emphasizes that we need the information from the neighboring nodes. <laughs> but that's what, what I'm saying. Like in, it, you said it emphasizes the, important of GN, the, the importance of GNNs, mm -hmm. but I mean, it just emphasizes the importance of also looking at the information of other nodes and not just the, your right, own. Right, right, right. Maybe, yeah, yeah, you, you're right. You're right. And uh, this is what I meant to say, actually, but uh, as, a pr as a consequence of that, we need <laughs> some differentiable method which may uh, aggregate information from the yeah. neighboring direct neighbors. <laughs> well, well you say. could also ignore all of, um, ignore that what neighbors, ignore the graph connectivity and look at all the other nodes, right? Mm -hmm. and then we can maybe say, yeah, using a graph neural network here is actually not important because if you just look at all the nodes, then you can make the, make, already make the right prediction. Um, Hannes, uh, Hannes seems to be talking about using deep sets or something like that, like treating the graph as a set of nodes that are just disconnected instead of uh, treating them individually, right? Yeah, for example. But yeah, I mean, this is, let's go on. Okay. Uh, so, um, Next experiment that we did, we uh, we did with the graph specification here specifically, we use it to uh, very simple uh, uh, specifications. Uh, the first one is the random specification when, where we randomly uh, sample 90% of uh, all edges in the graph and uh, drop it down. And in the max D, we, uh, we first competed this, the D, uh, which satisfies this this, uh, this uh, inequality. It's a maximal de input degree for each node. We wanted to 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 leave as much as it possible the the input degree uh, as higher as it possible input degree for each node for each node. And uh, if the after this comp computation of d, uh, we uh, check it for each uh, node if the in is bigger than D, we uh, drop it run, we pick it randomly D in minus D uh, edges and uh, drop it them. Uh, as a result, we again drop it 90% of uh, edges, but uh, with uh, keeping the maximum de degree, input degree as possible. So uh, here we have two, uh, two uh, experiments. So the, uh, and the first experiment, we used the random drop, and uh, after that, used the same uh, aggregation method, and computed the uh, estimated the recoverability loss. And after that, we uh, we train it a network uh, 
with this aggregation method, but with the learnable parameters uh, and received the following uh, test accuracies. And uh, we did we repeat the same thing. We did the same thing with a different uh, specification method. And what we see, we see the correlation between the uh, uh, recoverability loss and the accuracy. As the recoverability loss lower, then the accuracy is uh, higher. So we see that for all data sets. So it uh, actually emphasizes that. Uh, uh, we need we we may use the recoverability loss for finding a better uh, specification method. Okay. Uh, next uh, experiment. In the next experiment, we uh, check it the uh, correlation between the aggregation method different aggregation method that we take and the recoverability. So here we took five different aggregation methods. Uh, and uh, for each aggregation method, we uh, first, uh, for the fir uh, first uh, four uh, aggregation methods, we uh, drop it uh, all learnable parameters and convert it in the to, to the following. Uh, so we basically isolated only the aggregation and uh, use this aggregation uh, for computation of the recoverability loss. Uh, for the GUT, okay, uh, let's uh, get rid of GUT uh, for now. So uh, if you, uh, okay, we'll focus on only on the first uh, four currently. So uh, when, uh, after the computation of this uh, recoverability loss, we also applied this uh, aggregation methods uh, and use it Thus, for uh, computation of the test, uh, for the training of the network, and then computed the test accuracy. And uh, this is what we see here. We see here that on this uh, for uh, three plots, we see that uh, there is a correlation between the uh, recoverability loss and uh, the test accuracy. Uh, where I uh, uh, x axis uh, axis is here is the one divided by the recoverability loss. So I wanted to see that. Uh, as, as recoverability loss is uh, lower than the accuracy is higher. For the GUT, uh, I, uh, since I needed these parameters, uh, and those parameters are weights uh, according to which we aggregate the uh, information from the neighboring nodes, I first dropped the, uh, I first trained the network and then uh, saved these parameters, alphas. And uh, after that, drop it this uh, learnable parameters and define this aggregation method. Okay. And uh, compute the recoverability loss with this aggregation with respect to this aggregation method. And again, train the network with respect to this uh, uh, layer. And uh, compare it. Okay. And set this points also here. So this point is this, this violet one. So we see here the correlation between the uh, aggregation method uh, so between the recoverability loss and the accuracy, final accuracy that we achieve. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask. Since I'm not sure if it is uh, pretty clear that I understand uh, that I uh, explained it. No, I think this part is good. Okay. So uh, in the next experiment, I uh, wanted to check if we have an ability to use recoverability as a regularization parameter in, uh, in, uh, uh, during the training. So I took PPI data set and uh, trained it on the nine, layer, uh, nine layers uh, of type sageconf. Uh, after the training, I received the following uh, curve, test curve, the blue one. and uh, uh, after the training, I dump it all uh, intermediate uh, node representations and uh, computed for each for each layer, and computed the recoverability loss uh, for each uh, uh, for uh, a recoverability loss between the output and uh, the the target and the, this representation. So, if you remember. Uh, 
for the PPI that's a set, the recoverable loss uh, with respect to the uh, node features, we have uh, the following number, it's uh, 0 0.37. Uh, here after the, uh, when we add one layer, single layer, it reduces the recoverability loss. And if we add the two additional layers, we still reduce the recoverability loss. It means that it aggregates information till layer three. After layer three, we start to see that uh, we observe that uh, there is some destruction of the inf previously aggregated information. And uh, it's starting to be even worse after the addition of uh, additional layers. So what I did uh, after that, so it's look like some, some problem, we have some problem here with the, the depth. Uh, so what I did next, I uh, uh, implemented setting where, where, where I used this, I estimated during the training, the recoverability loss of each uh, layer and uh, used this recoverability, recoverability loss as a regularization parameter and uh, try and need the network from scratch again, I received the following uh, yellow uh, curve. So I increased the accuracy and uh, correspondingly uh, decreased the recoverability loss. So we actually, uh, two points here. So first of all, this regularization actually increased the training accuracy. Second, uh, we also uh, continue to to uh, aggregate information even for the four layers. Here we don't aggregate information for law for layers, and here we still aggregate information. Uh, okay. So I extended this uh, experiment for all other data sets. So these are results that we have uh, to obtain it. Uh, so we see here an interesting phenomenon that when, when we're training this data sets on three layer architecture, we see the following occurrences. And when we increase the number of layers, we, for some uh, data sets, we see the drop of the observed drop. Uh, this drop is basically, uh, uh, could be the reason of the following thing. So it, uh, it, uh, it stops aggregating information after the, after, after the third layer. And uh, uh, I mitigated this problem by using the recoverability losses uh, regularization a little bit. Uh, for all other uh, data sets, I actually uh, restored the, uh, the accuracy. And even uh, for the Reddit 2, I even uh, got better one than what, I, what we see here for three layers. OK, any questions, Salam? Okay. So, uh, self supervising uh, learning in okay in self supervised learning we uh, don't have why anymore and but we would like to aggregate uh, information from neighboring nodes as much uh, as much as it possible and uh, the best thing that we can achieve is. Uh, that the sigma algebra of H will be equal to the sigma algebra of, uh, of this uh, union, uh, since it's always a subset. So as this sigma algebra is larger, this uh, you have more uh, sub algebras and thus you have more uh, random variables in set uh, CH. And, uh, and, and, and thus this uh, uh, recoverable loss is smaller. Okay, is this more for, for this, case, it is the smallest one. So the question is how to obtain this thing. Uh, we suppose that we have the following uh, uh, equality. OK, then uh, it's uh, pretty straightforward. We can see that uh, uh, the sigma algebra of H is equal, equal to the, for this, for this uh, case, we have the, the equivalence. And uh, uh, and this actually uh, explains the fo following algorithm. So in the following, uh, following su self-supervised algorithm. So this is the main idea. We, we for each GNN layer, we uh, compute its uh, embedding. And then uh, from its embedding, we 
okay, this is the embedding. And then we, we uh, compute the recoverability loss of the embedding of the input with respect to the embedding and the recoverability loss of the neighborhood with respect to the embedding and uh, minimize it. And do this minimization for each uh, layer. And uh, okay, so we receive it the following uh, results. Okay, so here we see uh, each column here is the different data set. Each uh, row is a different architecture, and uh, x axis here is the depth, and the uh, y axis here is the is the test accuracy. And in each plot, we have uh, uh, four curves. The dashed blue one is the MLP, uh, which means that we just uh, drop it away all uh, all uh, edges in the in this data set, and then try it and apply the MLP. And the, the red dashed uh, line is the uh, state of the art, and uh, yellow and green is the supervised and unsupervised setting, where in the unsupervised, we uh, first uh, train the uh, representation, not representation with, uh, using this algorithm. And uh, after that, uh, we fix this, uh, we freeze this representations and apply MLP on the top of this re representations. Okay. So as, as a result, we see the following uh, uh, thing. So first of all, we see that uh, we are pretty close to the to the in some cases to the supervised setting, and uh, also we uh, see that we aggregate information. Okay, for the the accuracy increases when we add uh, more layers, so which means that we actually aggregate also information from the, from the distant nodes. Uh, okay, so uh, so till now we. Uh, talking only about the uh, recoverability, but uh, currently we have all, also uh, some works which uh, use uh, mutual information, uh, maximization between input and output uh, of, of uh, ag aggregation layers and uh, use, the, use this maximization for, for uh, learning uh, node representations in the self-supervised setting. So the valid question was, the uh, next valid question is, uh, what is the relationship between the recoverability and mutual information? Uh, sorry, can I ask a question on the previous slide? Uh, sure. Yeah, so here, when you discuss the supervised setting, you train the entire network from scratch, but mm -hmm. for the unsupervised, you freeze the network after being trained on recoverability and you just add an MLP on top of the fixed layer, right? Right. Yeah. Um, so it seems to me that this is an unfair comparison and that like a, a better comparison would be to fine tune the entire model after it has been pre-trained uh, in, in an unsupervised setting. So um, did you try that? Like, did you try fine tuning instead? I didn't try, I'm just afraid that um, I will uh, actually, if you are doing fine tuning, you actually train this. Uh, so I, wa I wanted to check how well I trained the representation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and if you are doing fine tuning, so you change also the representation and you, you, uh, you add the information uh, achieved from uh, from Y, okay? I I didn't want to add this information. I just wanted to check this uh, hypothesis. Okay. No, but I, I see here that like the representation that you have learned is uh, yeah, it, it can achieve uh, very close to um, uh, the, very close yeah, to in the, this slide fully trained Just, network uh, um, some, yeah but the, there are two like here what, what i see like there's a gap between uh th there's a gap where the unsupervised seems to outperform um uh, sorry where the supervised seems to outperform the unsupervised and this happens mm -hmm. in every graph and my point is that like mm -hmm. here the comparison is a bit uh, unfair because for the supervised 
uh, you train the entire network, but for the unsupervised, uh, you you just like fine tune an NLP on top of frozen layers. Uh, so right. fr from my point of view, like uh, two better baseline would be either you just uh, take the network with random embedding and you train an MLP okay. on top of that. So this network with random embedding will be much more comparable to the uh, to the unsupervised one. Because uh, then you will see well whether the unsupervised one has learned an embedding that's more meaningful than random. Because even randomly initiated uh, initialized graph neural network can still be um, can, can still have information about the, the given task and you can still put an MLP on top of that. Or the second approach would be to take the entire uh, unsupervised network and then train an MLP on top of that for a few epochs, then fine tune the entire network and see whether the unsupervised would uh, would achieve better results than the supervised. Because for, for me here, like it's really unclear whether um, the unsupervised one is better than a randomly initialized network. Because the comparison, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a good point, right? We need to actually, I think we need to check this. Uh, so I mean that uh, maybe a, even with the with the randomly uh, initialized uh, weights, uh, you aggregate the information from the neighboring nodes, and after that you freeze this uh, uh, graph representation and uh, train the MLP on the top of this first representation. You may achieve the same uh, the same results. This is what you meant. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So this is a good point, actually. A good point. But, where, uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's one we didn't check it. Yeah. yeah. So that's one comparison. Uh, to, to if you want to compare the frozen weights, that's the best way the way to do it. But then there's also that uh, the supervised model gets initialized with random weights. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, do initializing the supervised model with pre-trained weights is it better than initializing it with random weights? So these are the two comparison like. In both cases, one you compare the fine tuning versus uh, training from scratch on random ways, and the other you compare frozen uh, pre trained versus frozen random. Uh, and th this will give you a, a meaningful plot and maybe uh, even positive results because, like, wh when you look at this plot, uh, and uh, for a reviewer that would read the paper very, very quickly, he'll say that this is not good, the unsupervised is worse than the supervised. But with the other experiments, maybe you see the um, the opposite, where the unsupervised is actually better, um, mm -hmm. with, with the with the same experimental setting. Yeah. Okay. Good point. Uh, I understand you. Okay. Um, I'll think about that. <laughs> okay. So. Um, Okay, so the next uh, thing is the comparison between the recoverability and the mutual information. So the conventional definition of the entropy is uh, as follow. Here, the fx is the probability density function of random variable x. Um, but we have also the information theoretic definition of the entropy. And uh, as you see, it is fully uh, based on the sigma algebra of x. So instead of x, we need only the sigma algebra of x. What's mean? It means that if you have two random variables, uh, x and y, let's say, we share the same sigma algebra, uh, we will obtain the same entropy. If you'll compute entropy, then we will obtain the same entropy. And uh, it means that entropy actually estimates the how uh, rich this uh, sigma algebra is. And uh, uh, suppose that you have an additional thing with, okay, according to this definition, we can understand that if you have sigma algebra, the condition where sigma algebra of X is, uh, sigma algebra of X is a subset of sigma algebra of Y, then entropy of, of X is gonna be less or equal than the entropy of Y. Uh, okay. 
So the mutual information is defined in this case with uh, in, in the following way. Uh, here is the entropy of the of the x and y. It's uh, of, of two random variables, and uh, the entropy of x and y is basically the, it's 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 entropy of the sigma algebra generated from the union of these two things. And uh, assuming that we fix y, and we would like to maximize the mutual information, we are changing the uh, x. So when mutual information is uh, maximal, since uh, hx is uh, is constant, we only change uh, these two uh, terms. And uh, since this sigma algebra is a subset of this, uh, this entropy is less or equal than this entropy. And thus, the best, uh, this difference is, actually, is less or equal than zero. So the highest uh, mutual information is when uh, you have the equivalence, when this difference equal to zero. And when you have the equivalence, uh, you have the following inequality. Sigma algebra of y is a subset of sigma x. And this is exactly the recoverability. This is exactly what I define it, uh, y to be fully recoverable from x. So we, have, we, are, uh, we are able to learn y from x. So uh, from the point of view of the sigma algebra, maximization of uh, mutual information and from the one side and the uh, minimization of uh, recoverability loss, uh, do the same th similar thing, actually same thing from the point of view of the sigma algebras. So we took, uh, uh, we, took uh, we did a comparison against the results that we obtained from the, this paper, which uh, uses the mutual information maximization uh, for, uh, in unsupervised setting and compared our uh, results against this uh, uh, results that, that uh, in this paper. So those are our results and uh, those are results in the paper. So for those results are uh, initial. So we didn't uh, use the best uh, uh, network that we, we didn't play with the network. We fix, fix it some specific, uh, neural network and uh, work it with it. And, uh, but still now we, we see already uh, that we have a great improvement in the PPI data set. Uh, and uh, we are rather close for the Reddit and Pub, PubMed. So, uh, okay. Uh, several things that I would like to emphasize. So the first one is that uh, we understood that the recoverability loss minimization, mutual information uh, maximization are similar. Uh, but the mutual information, uh, estimation of mutual information is uh, challenging, especially for high dimensional random variables. And this is actually the case that we have in the neural network. Uh, we have neural entropic estimators, which uh, tend uh, to mitigate this shortage. Uh, those are uh, neural networks in their own right. So they, uh, which tries to, which uh, estimate the mutual information, but they involve uh, a lot of additional learnable parameters and it's uh, less convenient to work with them. Uh, on the other side, uh, recoverability loss estimation is efficient and that does not involve uh, additional learnable parameters. Uh, so, any, any questions? Mm, I'm not sure. Yeah, no, 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 no. No questions from, from my side. Let's now go into that uh, direction. Any questions from, from the chat or for anyone else than Dom and me? Do you, do you maybe have a, um, a statement that you can make or any thoughts on future work? Okay, so uh, we would like to extend this, um, okay. Currently, I talk it only about the non-property prediction tasks. Yeah, I would like to extend this uh, to the other 
uh, tasks, uh, graph property and uh, link property prediction. So this is the one, one, one thing that I would like to extend this work. Uh, it's it's in the context of the graph neural networks. Another uh, context is uh, is uh, the connection between uh, mutual information. So all methods which involve mutual information, uh, it's uh, interesting to check if uh, we can replace mutual information estimation by recoverable to loss. And um, we leave. we have a question um, about. If we have residual connections, how does this impact the uh, recoverability loss? And with that, for that, we can look at some, uh, you had some architectures with skip connections, right? Uh, no, no, no. The all architectures are without skip connections. Oh, uh, well, can you go a few slides back? Once again? Okay, can you go a few slides back? Uh, uh, which slide? Like when you're looking at the different the different GNN architectures. And different architectures. You mean this this? Mm, yes. I mean the sage conf, for example, it's basically a skip connection. Um, you when you talk about the skip connection, you mean the uh, information that you obtain from this from the node itself? A yeah. skip connection is after the activation. I mean, yeah, so after that we it have is an not. It is not a skip connection because you um, you transform the feature in some way, right? But yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, we transform it. After that, we have the deactivation. And I don't have a skip connection uh, before and after activation. Yeah. But it's an, uh, it's an interesting point to extend it to the different kind of architecture. Yeah, but, but the question also comes from the, um, if you have, have looked at other architectures that are the ways that deal with over smoothing, and how the recoverability loss behaves for them. And for example, like grant, or if we had skip connections. No idea, uh, we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, look at that. Uh, so I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cool. I think that yeah. I may say is that, uh, is that uh, we see the, the, the cl close relationship between the recoverability and the mutual information. So uh, every, think uh, what is working with the uh, mutual information should uh, work with the recoverability. <clears throat> should, <laughs> I don't know. I need, yeah, yeah. need to check uh, practically. <laughs> is the mutual information maximization some variant of the entropy search method? I might be remembering incorrectly, but some variants of entropy search method do not require parameter learning, just like with recoverability loss minimization method done here. Just like with the recoverability loss minimization method. Uh, it depends on uh, where exactly you compute this. Uh, if you compute the mutual information between uh, two intermediate uh, tensors in the network, so should probably somehow <laughs> approximate the, the, the probability density function. And uh, there are ways to approximate it without uh, learnable parameters, but uh, those are very pure things. They, uh, you obtain uh, um, results which are far away from the, from the theoretical results. <laughs> okay, well, fair. Um... Then any other last points from your side? Or... I, I actually, comp uh, this, this, was, um, this point was uh, my, my last slide, so. Then 
Professor Baskin, do you want to? Hey, uh, so first, uh, first, uh, thank you for having us. So and also thank you for the need for uh, actually he, he gave a very uh, interesting and uh, essential input. So I think that uh, <laughs> we will uh, we will uh, of course we will check it and uh, uh, yeah so. Uh, yeah, many open avenues for further explorations of recoverability on, on graphs, I think. And yeah, maybe you can pursue some of them yourself. And if you want to join future reading group sessions yourself, there's the Slack that you'll find in the description, our mailing list. And in the Slack, you can also vote for future papers. So join us and hopefully see you in the next one. Bye.